Hallo, guten Morgen. Herzlichen Glückwunsch Karl Marx. Wir freuen uns, dass wir hier zu den Ersten äh, gehören dürfen an dem Morgen, die ähm, äh, auf unserer großen Marx 200 Konferenz äh, den Morgen gestalten wir, äh, dürfen. Ganz herzliches Willkommen an euch alle und natürlich an Paul Mason und Sebastian Puschner. Ähm, Paul Mason ist äh, Journalist und ähm, Autor, Filmemacher und äh, vieles mehr aus Großbritannien. Sebastian Puschner ist verantwortlicher Redakteur für Politik und Wirtschaft ähm, der Zeitung Freitag. Wir haben heute vor, ähm, über das Thema Marx und Medien <lacht> zu diskutieren. Die beiden hier vorne, ich bin Johanna Bussemer, ich bin Leiterin des Europareferats in der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung. Und äh, einer der Anlässe ist, dass ähm, wir, präsent wir präsentieren wollen eine Kurzfilmreihe K steht vor Karl, die äh, Paul Mason im Auftrag der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung ähm, anlässlich des 200. Geburtstags von Karl Marx gestaltet hat. Und die Idee... Ähm, dahinter war, dass wir beide in einer langen Konversation darüber waren, wie erklärt man eigentlich den Menschen heute äh, das, was Karl Marx, aber auch andere, Rosa Luxemburg, Gramsci, viele andere denken oder gedacht haben. Ähm, und da kam ähm, Paul mit dieser Idee, dieser Kurzfilme, die wir dann umgesetzt haben. Wir präsentieren jetzt die ersten beiden. Einige haben sie vielleicht schon gesehen. Wir äh, veröffentlichen jede Woche im Moment einen, sozusagen rund um den Geburtstag. Am Montag äh, wird der vierte veröffentlicht. Ihr dürft hier heute schon den Preview sehen. Ähm, Montag in einer Woche kommt der letzte. Wir schauen jetzt zwei, gehen dann in die Diskussion miteinander. Paul wird ein bisschen erzählen, äh, was hinter der Idee steckt und was die politische Bedeutung davon ist, so ein Material zu publizieren. Sebastian wird ein bisschen erzählen, ähm, wie der Freitag eigentlich jetzt mit dem Jubiläum von Karl Marx umgegangen ist, aber auch was solche Jubiläen, de, der Umgang äh, mit äh, Denkern, Philosophen und so weiter heutzutage im Journalismus und in den Medien bedeutet. Und dann werden wir relativ schnell das äh, Podium auch für euch und eure Fragen und Anregungen öffnen. Wir stehen jetzt nochmal auf, nur damit wir rennen nicht weg, nur damit ihr den Film besser sehen könnt, auch obwohl wir natürlich auch sehr interessant anzusehen sind äh, und kommen dann nach den ersten beiden Filmen wieder. Die Filme werden nicht übersetzt, sind aber Englisch mit deutschen Untertiteln. No thinker has influenced the modern world more than Karl Marx. But what did he really think? I'm Paul Mason, and to mark the 200th anniversary of Karl Marx's birth, I'm going to explain some of his key ideas and why they're still relevant to us today. And the only place to start is here, Berlin, where Marx came in 1836 to study philosophy. When Marx arrived here in Berlin, there were three revolutions underway in the world. There was the Industrial Revolution, there was the struggle for democracy, which had just broken out again in France, and there was the Scientific Revolution. The job of a philosopher was to make sense of it all, and one philosopher in particular dominated people's thinking about social change. Meet Georg Hegel. Hegel said, all human history is progress towards the goal of freedom. When we campaign for human rights, or make a scientific discovery, or fight a war, That's really the mind of God trying to think its way towards freedom, said Hegel. A world spirit forcing us to act, sometimes in ways we just don't understand. Marx arrived in Berlin five years after Hegel died and in the clubs where the left-wing students drank they didn't believe in God. They attacked Hegel and his theory of history and they attacked the Prussian government and the total absence of democracy and free speech. But what drives history is a good question. Marx said let's start by taking God out of the equation. What drives history is not God but something specific to our human nature our ability to work. 
and to work to a conscious plan, altering the world around us by imagining something better, communicating it through language and making it happen. That's the essence of our human nature. A lot of people today will say there's no such thing as human nature. If so, we're just a sack of bones at the mercy of our environment and our DNA and our Facebook page with no real purpose. Marx says the purpose of human beings is to set themselves free. Humans, he says, are a species being. Now what does that mean? Well, when we make something, we're generally not making it for ourselves, but for somebody else. And if we have a great idea, what usually happens is we run off and tell somebody else about it. We exist for each other. We're a social animal. That's why we have a history. We create change. The streets of Berlin have seen a lot of history. In Marx's time, it came to barricades, and then they saw the rise of Nazism and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Marx says the source of all social conflict and the unhappiness that drives it is the fact that we build societies that stop us from cooperating and sharing because they're always based on private property and they always create power hierarchies. And here's the word Marx uses to describe the result. Alienation. We're alienated from our inner selves and estranged from each other. For Marx, alienation doesn't just mean we get depressed, we hate our jobs, or that we feel bad about the world. It means we're constantly using our creative powers in the wrong way. We make things, but the things we make, machines, states, religions, they end up controlling us. So if you want to understand Marx's theory of alienation, just Take out your smartphone and ask yourself, do I control this or does it control me? That's alienation. The things we make take control of us and separate us from each other. By the time he left Berlin, Karl Marx had started a revolution in ideas, but soon he would find out what a revolution looks like for real. The year is 1847. Then, as now, London was the financial capital of capitalism. Here, Karl Marx set out to write a document that still has the power to inspire people and to terrify the elite. The Communist Manifesto. But what exactly did Karl Marx mean by communism? Let's get one thing clear, Marx did not invent communism. Even in the Middle Ages, monks held property in common and lived a communal lifestyle. In the English Civil War, the revolutionaries wanted to abolish private property. And as a young radical, Marx was surrounded by workers who wanted to live in communes, like Etienne Cabet, who told his followers to move from Paris to Texas to set up communes none of which survived. Marx said communism means abolishing private property, but to get there you need two things, technological progress so that machines do all the work, and social progress so that everybody can live a rich, rounded, cultural life. By 1847 Marx was active in the Communist League. These were mainly German workers, they were revolutionaries and wanted men in their own country. It was in this pub, in Soho, London, that Marx and the Communist League sat down in November 1847 to thrash out what does communism stand for? After days of arguing, the workers said to Marx, you go away and write it all down in a manifesto explaining what communism really is. And be quick about it, because the revolution's coming. A spectre is haunting Europe, Marx wrote. The spectre of communism. 
But it wasn't the spectre of some isolated communes where people shared out the work and the food and practiced free love, though these places existed. Communism, said Marx, can only happen through a working class revolution. All history is the history of class struggles, Marx wrote. In ancient Greece and Rome, it was slave against master. In medieval times, it was the serfs against the lords, sometimes the lords against the king, and sometimes the king against the pope. But industrial capitalism had made things very simple. It's the workers versus the capitalists, a death match. And if the workers win, you get a whole new kind of revolution. You can see where the idea came from. In the 19th century, workers had almost no possessions. They worked 12 hours a day in bleak conditions, and most middle-class people despised them. But Marx said they are the future of humanity. But it didn't happen. Here, in the very same street Marx lived, in poverty, there are now plenty of workers and they own plenty of property and they have no obvious intention of overthrowing capitalism. There is a tension inside Marx's thinking about the working class. Sometimes he says they are destined to overthrow capitalism whatever the ideas they hold in their heads. But at other times he says the workers are going to overthrow the system because they are conscious and educated and have strong ideals. After the revolutions of 1848, Marx spent his life here in London trying to educate socialist-minded workers and form an international party. But what those workers actually built were organisations to help them survive capitalism, socialist parties, cooperatives and trade unions. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx set out ideas that have remained influential. That the everyday struggles of working people actually lead somewhere to a better society, and that they, the workers, the peasants and the poor, have far more in common with each other across borders than they have with the elite that rules their own country. As the final line of the manifesto says, workers of the world, unite. auf die Idee gekommen äh, für diese Filme. Warum möchtest du Marx im ähm, 200 Jahre Marx-Jahr so präsentieren? Okay. So, um, I spent my career as a TV journalist um, working out answers to how to explain complicated things to a wide television audience. Is the mic okay? Um, and and in that career, we developed certain techniques that, are, that work, and you could almost say are classic techniques. That is, we, there's the piece to camera, which is a correspondent speaking with authority, and there are animated graphics, um, and some, as we call, general views, or B-roll, of images of the general situation. Now, it, these films were made by three people, me, Theopis Skarlatos, who is my regular contributor, who's worked with me since the Greek crisis, and she filmed, edited, and directed everything. Uh, and Alan Warburton, who is the animator. Uh, and we, so we, we thought the best monument we can do for Marx is to really use the ultra-bourgeois technique of the mainstream media to explain in a classic way one idea simply. So that's, what, that's what all we're trying to do. Now, of course, there are many interpretations of Marx. There, there will be people in this audience who say, I, that's, I don't agree with that. But what, I'll give you an example of what the effect is. I don't know how many people have viewed this, maybe not so many, but everybody who has given me feedback has said how useful it was for them in clarifying, above all with the alienation concept, what it really means. So yesterday, the, the biggest radio show in Britain, which is the Jeremy Vine Show, it's aimed at sort of middle class, middle England, six million listeners. They did half an hour about Marx in which I discussed basically 
these films uh, with the most right-wing philosopher in Britain, uh, Roger Scruton, and, um, and Jeremy Vine, who is this nice but utterly centrist bourgeois um, presenter, he, he understood alienation. And then even better, they asked people to phone in and give a 45-second um, account of a key idea by Marx. And a woman, just an ordinary woman, phoned in and gave a 45-second explanation of um, Selbstentfremd Selbstentfremdung, the, of alienation. It was, so that's why we did it. Und you have to... Ah, uh, okay. <lacht> Was äh, glaubst du, ist der politische Beitrag dieser Filme? Nun könnten ja Leute sagen, ja, das ist eine populäre Aufarbeitung, aber was bringt die uns jetzt ganz genau, wenn wir versuchen müssen, die Linke auf dem Gedankengut von Marx und anderen äh, zu stärken, gerade in Europa, speziell in der Situation äh, zwischen Großbritannien und Europa, hier in Deutschland und überall? Okay. Um, no. Another reason why, why these films will be useful um, is that although now it's the uh, anniversary of Marx's death, um, they'll be there, sitting there free forever. Uh, and, and so the context of this is, in the British Labour Party, we have half a million members now, 250,000 people extra joined. Many of them are not, um, have no political training. Um, And we have found it incredibly useful to create what uh, the bourgeoisie calls content. That is, short uh, pieces of video content to be able to, for people to use to share as campaigning uh, material and also f to educate themselves. I hope some of you will come to these events regularly now, about twice a year. Momentum, which is the left group inside uh, Labour, organises educational conferences called The World Transformed, TWT. And it, it's been amazing, actually, to bring this, a combination of the old politicized workers with the new networked youth, with people who are just very, very unpolitical, people from uh, public housing estates, into a room and educate them. And, and the example was, um, We had a big meeting in, uh, outside the Labour Party conference last year, which people queued around the block to come into. It was oversubscribed, um, and it was about neoliberalism. And we started by saying, put your hand up if you think you can explain what neoliberalism is. And out of about 400 people, five put their hand up. So we realized that we were in this, in, you know, the legacy of neoliberalism and the smashing of the workers' movement in Britain has been that there is no political education And so, if we can, you know, we don't have foundations like uh, Rosa Luxemburg's Stiftung. We, it, we just don't have this level of resources in Britain. But when we find them, we need, we need to be able to create these permanent, simple, uh, shareable pieces of educa educational and political content. Um, and we're really grateful to the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for putting uh, the money up that made these. They were incredibly cheaply done, I would add. All the music is what you call... Um, Uh, premium beat. It's it's um, it, everything is from from the from, everything is very very cheap uh, commoditized stuff except the graphics because Alan uh, is a professional uh, animator and we had to pay him. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I was never bargaining that good before those films. Uh, they were very cheap and they are very well done. And um, danke. Um, Sebastian, ihr habt ähm, auch beim äh, Freitag, äh, glaube ich, zwei Titel mit Marx gehabt im letzten Jahr. Du hast mir im Vorgespräch erzählt, ja, die, ähm, die waren besonders starke Auflagen. Ihr habt eine große Menge an Merchandising-Material im Nachhinein dazu produziert. Ähm, warum hat Marx auch äh, bei euch in der Zeitung so eine große Bedeutung? Wie seid ihr da rangegangen? Ne? Was ist da jetzt gerade passiert? Also die... Sag mal, eine der größten Herausforderungen, denen wir uns jede Woche beim Zeitung machen gegenübersehen, äh, gegenüberstehen und gegenübersehen, so ist, 
was wir auf dieser Titelseite da vorne drauf zeigen. Weil im Idealfall funktioniert das halt so auf den ersten Blick und man weiß sofort, was damit gemeint ist und was es geht und dann interessiert einen die Zeitung oder interessiert sie nicht und dann kauft man sie oder man kauft sie nicht. Und dafür ist natürlich Marx gerade jetzt zu diesen Jubiläen, also das, die erste Ausgabe war die hier vergangenes Jahr in Bezug auf das Jubiläum des Kapitals, die letzte jetzt zum 200. Ende April, ja, das funktioniert halt. Man äh, guckt da drauf, man weiß, äh, was los ist. Und ich glaube, wenn wir uns es jetzt geleistet hätten, keine solchen Marx-Titel äh, zu, zu machen, dann wäre der Aufschrei äh, in der Leserschaft, in der geneigten Leserschaft, ein wesentlich größerer gewesen, als er es auch so war. Weil natürlich wir auch eine sehr kritische Leserschaft haben, die dann, wenn beispielsweise Paul äh, bei uns in der Zeitung das aufschreibt, was er auch in seinem Buch Postkapitalismus aufgeschrieben hat, dann gleich sagen, aber Moment, äh, das ist doch viel zu utopisch oder so geht das doch nicht und das Maschinenfragment ist da total falsch gelesen oder sonst was. Aber ähm, wenn man so einen Titel eben macht, dann ist das immer auch verbunden mit natürlich so einer gewissen ökonomischen Verwertungslogik. Ne? Natürlich haben wir sozusagen bei uns im Haus irgendwie auch den Wunsch, äh, aus dem Verlag so, wir brauchen irgendwie was, womit wir auch werben können, ne? was wir sozusagen auf genau so einen Banner drauf machen können, womit man irgendwie den Freitag äh, assoziiert. Und wir haben jetzt vor kurzem äh, in dieser letzten Marx-Ausgabe also sechs Texte zum 200. von Marx gehabt. Mein Liebster war der kürzeste dabei, eine Rezension von äh, Stefan Kaufmann, Wirtschaftsjournalist hier aus Berlin, dieses neun kleinen Büchleins Mythen über Marx. Und das, finde ich, ist so prädestiniert dafür, wie man, glaube ich, als Zeitung, als Medium oder eben auch als Publizist wie Paul mit diesen Filmen so mit Marx heute umgehen kann und diesen, diesen Bildungsaspekt sozusagen rüberbringen kann. Weil Stefan Kaufmann hat da ein total wichtiges äh, Buch rezensiert und, und, und in diesem Buch, in der Einladung, ich habe das mal mitgebracht, steht also etwas ganz Bezeichnendes. Ähm, Mythen über Marx heißt das Buch, ich kann es wie gesagt sehr empfehlen, es räumt eben also mit vermeintlichen Verständnis und Unverständnis in Bezug auf Marx auf und die Autoren schreiben im Vorwort also, als Vorurteile oder Urteile geistern die Mythen in den Köpfen und Feuilletonspalten und ersetzen nicht selten die eigene Auseinandersetzung mit dem marxischen Denken. Marx selbst hätte sicher seine Freude daran gehabt, nachzuzeichnen, wie der Effizienz- und Wettbewerbsdruck in der Medien- und Pressebranche dazu führt, Zeit und Kosten bei der Recherche einzusparen, wie gleichzeitig aber jede Redaktion sich dazu genötigt sieht, den Marx-Hype nicht ungenutzt zu lassen. Denn so viel ist klar, ein Marx-Titel mit einem Konterfei und Sonnenbrille verkauft sich derzeit gut. Das stimmt natürlich, dem ist natürlich zuzustimmen. Die Frage ist aber natürlich, ist es, ist es gut oder schlecht? Ich finde, es ist gut. Der Titel übrigens war zwar einer der besser verkauften äh, im vergangenen Jahr. Der lag so ungefähr so 100 Exemplare über dem Durchschnitt letzten Jahres, aber er war auch nicht jetzt nur in den Top 5. Also so die absolute Garantie für den totalen Verkaufs- und kommerziellen Erfolg ist Marx dann leider doch auch nicht im Jubiläumsjahr. Was war der meistverkaufte Titel? Ja, das war, waren die Titel um die Bundestagswahl rum. Da ist einfach das Interesse sozusagen am höchsten, da ist sozusagen der Grad der Politisierung am höchsten und ich finde, wir hatten in der Woche nach der Bundestagswahl zum Beispiel einen furchtbaren Titel, der hat schrecklich ausgeguckt, das war so Merkel als Oma und Lindner und Karin äh, göring eckert als Krankenpfleger und keine Rente mit 63 war, glaube ich, die Zeile. Ich sah ja, es war, sah furchtbar aus, aber das war der bestverkaufteste Titel letztes Jahr, einfach weil das Interesse am höchsten ist dann. Hallo, jetzt bin ich wieder da. Ein Spiegelredakteur hat mir mal vor vielen Jahren erzählt, dass die Auflage des Spiegel immer am höchsten ist, wenn Hitler zu sehen ist oder ein Tier und am besten ist Hitler mit einem Schäferhund. Ich glaube, die Zeiten äh, sind jetzt äh, langsam vorbei. Wir, 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 sehen, ähm, äh, wir sehen, dass da auch andere Sachen gehen. Trotzdem noch mal ganz kurz, wenn ihr jetzt... Äh, da in so eine Produktion einsteigt und sagt, okay, 200 Jahre Marx, wir müssen da was machen, das ist irgendwie klar und logisch. Wie geht ihr dann da dran? Was, was wollt ihr präsentieren? Also für mich zum Beispiel ist immer, ist, ich, ich, ich bin einfach total glückselig, dass wir so jemanden wie Paul auch als Autoren haben, weil es für uns schon am attraktivsten ist, so nach vorne zu denken. Also nicht nur so, was sagt er jetzt uns heute in Bezug auf sozusagen die Analyse des, des Standes des Kapitalismus heute, sondern so, was lässt sich daraus irgendwie auch gewinnen an, 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 an Perspektive, an ja, Optimismus. Und ich finde, ähm, also in der letzten Ausgabe, so der Titel war ja dann auch äh, Alles neu macht der Marx. 
ähm, da hat, hatten wir eben beispielsweise diesen Text von Paul und ich finde, auch wenn ich nach jedem Text, den ich dann von Evgeny Morozov zu diesem ganzen Digitalisierungssthema lese und da immer wieder ins Grübeln komme und denke, ah, ist das jetzt wirklich mit dem Postkapitalismus so sozusagen, wenn wir erstmal alle Arbeit voll automatisiert haben sozusagen, werden wir dann wirklich befreit sein, ist das sozusagen die Perspektive, ich komme da auch immer wieder ins Hadern, aber das ist glaube ich wirklich was, was wir noch auch viel stärker in Zukunft machen wollen, dieses sozusagen was wir so ein bisschen auch verlernt haben oder wo wir um diesen ganzen gesellschaftlichen Rechtsruck überall in Europa so darunter laborieren, wirklich nicht mehr so eine, so eine einfach es zu wagen, eine, eine, eine positive Lesart, eine, eine zukunftsgewandte Lesart, gerade auch in Bezug der Digitalisierung so, so zu wagen. Und, da, und das, das ist, glaube ich, so ja, für mich das Attraktivste an diesem Ganzen, so wirklich nach, nach vorne zu schauen und zu schauen, so was lässt sich denn eben gewinnen und, und gestalten sozusagen in, in der Zukunft. Aber äh, ganz wichtig auch noch in Bezug auf diese Filme, ähm, ich finde ja, ich finde die wirklich klasse, weil sie genau auch diese, diesen, diesen, ja, diesen Bildungscharakter haben und diese einfache Sprache. Ja, das, das, dafür muss ich nicht irgendwie das Kapital gelesen haben oder sonst was, um das zu verstehen. Ich Check das einfach. Und ich habe zum Beispiel letztes Jahr selbst einen Text geschrieben am Freitag, das war dieser erste Titel da. Ich bin alles andere als ein äh, Exper ähm, Experte in Bezug auf Marx und ich habe das Kapital nicht äh, von hinten bis vorne gelesen, um Gottes Willen, äh, gebe ich ganz offen zu. Aber für mich war der Ausgangspunkt zu diesem Text damals so eine Alltagsbeobachtung. Ich saß mit irgendwie so fünf, sechs gleichaltrigen Freundinnen und Freunden so in einer Kneipe und das Thema kam irgendwie so auf Gewerkschaften, ja. Und dann stellte sich raus, nicht nur, dass ich der Einzige war, der in der Gewerkschaft organisiert ist, sondern alle anderen fünf, sechs, die da um mich rum saßen, haben auch wirklich überhaupt nicht den Hauch einer Idee gehabt, warum sie um alles in der Welt, obwohl alle angestellt, in die Gewerkschaft eintreten sollten. Ja, und das war für mich sozusagen der Ausgangspunkt, um dann auch auf sowas wie, ja, Klassenbewusstsein, irgendwie so eine, so eine Grundahnung von äh, Konflikt, Kapital, Arbeit, also einfach so, 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 so ganz elementarste Basissachen wieder äh, zu wecken. Ich glaube, das ist durchaus auch so ein Ansatzpunkt, wofür den wir auch immer Schreibende suchen, die, die das in einer guten, einfachen und, 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 und attraktiven Sprache so rüberbringen können und ihr Wissen über Marx insofern produktiv machen. Mikro, Mikro, ja, Stichwort äh, Klassenpolitik. Es gibt ja, also wir streiten ja auch gerade hier wieder und sagen, wir brauchen eigentlich eine neue Klassenpolitik, ähm, weil wir uns natürlich auch fragen, wie können wir ne, ohne irgendwelche äh, Ressentiments von AfD-Wählern oder anderen irgendwie zu bedienen. Ne? Wie können wir trotzdem sagen, okay, wir sind erfolgreich, wenn wir einen Marx-Kongress machen, sind hier 1300 Leute, ihr habt lange Schlangen, ne, wenn ihr äh, eure Labour-Veranstaltung macht. Und trotzdem müssen wir immer noch überlegen, wie gehen wir noch einen Schritt weiter. Ne? Da ist natürlich die Frage, können wir das mit so einem Film, ich kann dich ein bisschen beruhigen, äh Paul, ich müsste jetzt meinen äh, Medienchef Henning fragen, aber bei uns werden, wird jeder Film mindestens 8000 Mal angeguckt ähm, in einer Woche. Also die laufen schon extrem die laufen schon extrem gut. Trotzdem ist natürlich die Frage an euch beide jetzt auch nochmal, sozusagen können wir diese Formate, diese Art zu arbeiten ausbauen, um zu sagen, wir erreichen nochmal mehr Leute aus unserem eigenen Umfeld heraus? Ich, ich würde sagen, bitte, 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 unbedingt auf jeden Fall, weil es gibt ganz viele auch großartige und interessante Aufsätze zu neuer Klassenpolitik und, und, und Diskurse, auch, aber gerade eben auch in akademischen Milieus, die sind natürlich total interessant und äh, auch ich lese das sozusagen gern und das bringt mich äh, weiter, aber, aber ohne sozusagen wirklich solche Formate mit einer ganz einfachen Sprache, mit sozusagen dieser Konzentration auf ein Schlagwort oder so weiter, ähm, wird das gesamtgesellschaftlich dann nicht, 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 nicht wirken. Drum bitte, bitte, bitte. Und ich, ich, mich würde ja interessieren, ob Paul noch ein bisschen erzählen kann in Bezug auf Labour und Momentum in Großbritannien. Welche, welche also du hast es ja schon ein bisschen gemacht und, und, und angefangen, aber welche Rolle da denn jetzt Marx spielt oder wie geht denn jetzt zum Beispiel Labour äh, gerade mit dem 200. Geburtstag um? Gibt es da auch irgendwas? Äh, One, two, yeah. So, um, before answering that, I want to try and say what, what I think today should be. To, 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 today, the 200th anniversary. It, it's a good opportunity, um, like 
I also write about, about music, and then the, the 200th anniversary of Wagner was a great opportunity to, to, to do this with Wagner. It's a great opportunity to almost separate two areas of intellectual work. One is to understand, quantify, discuss what Marx actually wrote, said, and thought. Now this, I think, you know, we are, there should be more university departments, more documentaries, uh, popular or specialist, which actually ask themselves, what did Marx think? Why? We know that even now, the German ideology, the full uh, text has not been properly uh, published. We know that there, are, there is a, a, an interpretation battle, uh, you could broadly say, and this is relevant to Labour, the humanist Marxists like me, uh, and almost like the techno-utopians, who are not so humanist, and then on the other side, the more classic orthodox Marxists, who, uh, on be, Althusser and beyond, would reject my interpretation of Marx. Well, that's a good debate to have. You could fill an entire university three years with this debate. And with information tools, that we now have, I think it becomes easier to resolve some of the debates. Um, we have standard formats for information, and you can express one idea against another idea, and it should be possible to say logically who is right on something very specialist in Marxism, but very important, called the transformation problem. How does value become price? Now, it should be possible to construct a logical um, algorithm that says either this is right or that is right. We should carry on the work on Marx. But Marxists have a method. And the point about the method is, the, and I think this is the other part of the work and more important, is to apply the method to reality. Now then we have a thousand different answers, not two or three schools. But that's good. You know, uh, Silvia Federici, uh, the Caliban and the Witch, the, the, the book about uh, women's exploitation. That's in the tradition of Marx, but it says, it comes to a conclusion that's opposed to Marx. That's, that's the work going forward. And I think my generation, so I went to university in 1978 when everything was Marxism, you know, my generation um, mixed up these two things. We, we, because we thought there was a continuity and, and therefore when, as we as we applied our Marxism, we were also learning our Marxism. And I think that I would like to see almost the application set free from the historiography of Marx. Now, I'll finish by saying, why is this important for labor? Well, it's really interesting. Um, I would, if you want to say, what is the strongest intellectual tradition on the left of labor for my generation? I was a Trotskyist, I'm no longer a Trotskyist, uh, but um, it, wasn't, it was kind of Trotskyism or orthodox Soviet Marxism. That's the, that's the, if you meet a, a, an old miner or engineer who is politicized, that's what they believe. The youth, it's very interesting. Very few subscribe to the humanistic Marx that I support, many are effectively post-postmodernists. They are structuralist Marxists who, who think, who in their minds, um, postmodernism, Foucault, etc., is right, and therefore they are engaged in a lot of techno-utopianism in which the, pros the idea that, um, that humans and machines have the same rights, uh, is, they, they quite like that idea. Now, I, I hate that idea. So, um, for me, the intellectual battle is very important to try and at least engage those young people who've been effectively educated by uh, post-humanism, transhumanism, post-modernism, structuralism, uh, that, there isn't, that there's a more malleable set of ideas that they should be engaged with. They see my Marxism as a kind of moral philosophy. And I'm quite happy for it to be seen as a moral philosophy because I think Marxism is a moral philosophy for the whole humanity over the entire period of history. Um, but they, that, that's, how, that's why I think it's relevant. Uh, and, uh, and you can see where they'll end up as well. They, they quite like the, um, the plan. 
the, the even the youth, age 21, they you know they they'll wear you know the the hammer and sickle badge and talk about five year plans if you let them. Wenn ich jetzt die Ergebnisse der Lokalwahlen äh, in die aktuellen richtig interpretiert habe, sieht man da aber auch wieder äh, in den, ne, das, was, äh, für das, was die vielleicht neue Labour Party jetzt unter Jeremy Corbyn steht, äh, seid ihr in den Großstädten sehr stabil und habt ein gutes Ergebnis eingebracht und in den ländlichen Regionen, strukturschwachen Regionen, die industrialisierten Regionen, äh, funktioniert das nicht so richtig. Äh, wie habt ihr jetzt vor, Marc, da ein bisschen mehr wieder hinzubringen. Okay, there's not much we can do with Marx uh, in these areas. But, but what is interesting is the question of the working class. Um, so on Thursday, Labour, in the local elections, Labour made, uh, again, very impressive gains, advances in big cities. Uh, Of course, the, the media interpreted this as, a, as not good, but, but we even lost ground, we lost seats in some old working class areas. And there is, what is happening is uh, in the worst, in the places that we find most challenging is that working class is becoming redefined as white nationalism. And rejection, not only of left politics, but of what you might call social modernity. We don't like, you know, gays, gays, feminists. Uh, you know, it's, there's this really nasty uh, reactionary idea. Now, I have no problems in combating. I come, I come from a town exactly like this, and and what happened is my dad and my grandfather and and all my cousins, they would say there are re progressive workers and there are ignorant reactionary workers. And the picket line is a line where the progressive workers stop the ignorant reactionary workers from going into work when we're on strike. In other words, the labor movement is a line drawn through the working class. We always knew this. But my goodness, how hard it is for these youth from the cities to do this. Because they, they have no moral authority to say that. You're a scab, you're a reactionary, you're a racist. They, they almost think, shit, what do we do? And I think the whole of the European left has that same problem right now. We just have it in a dramatic way. And so, our, the inside British Labour, there was a small right-wing current, which I think there is also a very similar current actually in Delinka, which wanted to, to, to give concessions to the ideas of these workers. And what Corbynism says is no, we cannot do that. We are a party of lesbians, gays, transgender, women, black people, workers, youth. That's who we are. But do you want 250 billion pounds to rebuild your town? That's the argument we had in the election. Some workers publicly on TV will say, I don't care if the economy collapses, I just want the migrants to go away. They will say it. Others would say, yes, we want 250 billion pounds to rebuild the whole of society. That's the debate we have. It's very instrumental. There's very little, as it were, political philosophy in it. And that is the strategy. And so far, it will only work if we can communicate and this is Gramsci, if we can create an ideological hegemony for our idea, which they can enthusiastically sign up to. And I think this is also true in places like Turingia, you know, uh, for you, for Pomen, the rest. It, it's not, it, the first stage is to say, we'll give you the rebuilding of society. And the second th stage is to say, and on that basis, can you bring yourself to come to a meeting where people from the cities also are, and meet them, and let's create a movement where the two traditions begin to speak to each other. That's our, that's, we're not there yet. Es hört sich für mich ein bisschen so an, als versuchtet ihr die schwierige Dreiecksbeziehung zwischen Marx, Foucault und Gramsci zu vermitteln in den Wahlen. Aber schauen wir mal, äh, wie das weitergeht. Ich würde jetzt... Ähm, Gerne gucken, ob es schon erste äh, Fragen aus dem Publikum gibt. Ja, hier vorne geht es gleich los. Haben wir ein Saalmikrofon? Es kommt. Nee, es kommt. Äh, da wird eins 
da wird eins gebracht. Unten, äh, unten einmal den Knopf äh, umschieben und anschalten. Sehr klein, aber einfach drücken. Geht, sonst geben wir hier eins von unseren, wenn das schwierig ist. Wir kommen auch mit einem zurecht. Ja, hier vorne war die erste Frage. Gibt es schon weitere? Ich sammle dann. Ah ja, ja, ich merke mir das. Um, hello, uh, this question is for Paul. Thank you so much for this really uh, instructive films. As a humanist Marxist, I presume that you believe that the overcoming of alienation is possible. And do you believe that? And if that's the case, um, that inevitably presuppose understanding of a subject, the subject that gets the alienated. Therefore, I will ask you, what understanding of the subject do you have? So those two kind of big questions. Okay, so my contribution in the English press to, uh, I wrote the thing in Der Freitag uh, about Marx, but I wrote a 300, sorry, a 3,000 word article in the New Statesman, which came out yesterday, in which I have a, an, an imaginary dialogue with four people in a photograph. Trotsky, his wife, Sedova, um, Frida Kahlo, the painter, and Trotsky's secretary, Rea Donayevskaya, who, who is a humanist Marxist. And I'm trying to say to them, what would I say to you if I could speak to you in, in 1938? And it is that the Marxism they had learned from the second and third internationals was not anti-humanist, actually, but it, it wasn't the whole story. They didn't have the Grundrisse, they didn't have um, some of Marx's more Hegelian notebooks, and of course, they didn't have the... 1844 economic and philosophical manuscripts. And so I wanted to say to them, you, you have, there is a conflict in your Marxism between its desire to be humanistic and its inability to express that humanism because you only have, what did Trotsky read as a young man? anti During, Engels. Uh, dialectics of nature, Engels. Plekhanov, uh, the explanations of socialism, scientific socialism. So, The, the article ends with, with, a, with an assessment of Frida Kahlo. It's interesting, because Kahlo was an overt Marxist. People don't know this. You go to the museum, she's now the saint of feminism, and good. She wrote, I believe in the materialist dialectic of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao Zedong. That's what she wrote. And her last painting is called Frida and Stalin. And it's a painting of Frida Kahlo and Stalin. Why? If you look at her paintings, they're utterly humanistic. But then she changes. And she says, no, you know, after, it, after Trotsky is killed, I choose Stalin, she says. Now, I think that's the product of a non-humanistic Marxism. She couldn't reconcile her painting with Marxism, which is a tragedy. So I end this uh, article <laughs> with the following words. If I could say one thing to you, it is this. Paint what you want. Love whom you want. F fuck the vanguard party. <laughs> the revolutionary subject is the self. That, that I think, is the, the, my expression of Marx going forward. Um, uh, I'm Javed Nakwi. I'm from India. I saw a bit of the film because I walked in late. But um, listening to you, a few thoughts. Um, we come, I come from um, a Tower of Babel, as it were, where you have many languages in India and, and many, many more dialects. So my first problem is the language in which I communicate from Uh, Tamil Nadu to Kashmir, from Assam to Gujarat, it varies. Um, therefore, I was sitting while listening to you and thinking whether there was a silent way of uh, conveying the message. And because we are talking of budgets also, there ha it has to be a cheap uh, project. Um, 
and there are many, many issues. You cannot just say this is Karl Marx and this is, how do you, therefore, it's a gargantuan problem sitting, um, maybe you, you will take time off and try to explain this to me because it may not be of interest to the wider audience here. Um, how do we therefore cope with this very imposing problem of conveying simple messages? Um, humanistic is I probably the route I would also choose because it touches the heart rather than the, the scientific uh, explanations of the linkages of society. That might be a little circuitous. So I want to understand really how to go about this business that you have uh, started and doing so well in England. Uh, because so far from whatever I've heard, it's very Eurocentric and it's not just working class and industry and capitalism, it also deals in our situation with the peasantry, which is, uh, you know, which has also got the same problems. It's not, in fact, it is more intractable than the working class. You, you've seen cleavages in the working class where uh, it thinks in terms of uh, capitalist ideas, in terms of exploitive, in terms of racism. The working class is divided. It wants to throw out, um, you know, on, on the basis of uh, race and color and, and whatever its regressive perceptions. So, it's, it's, I've just posed a, a very large thought. If, if, we, if there was the money to turn this into a more international thing, what I would say to do is take the non-verbal parts, which are the graphics done by Alan Warburton, and we could commission more, uh, but it did take more than half the budget, uh, uh, and get somebody speaking in the local language to do either my script or a different script, uh, roughly, saying, roughly saying the same thing. I do believe that we have to that that we have to localize um, all messages. What I learned as a mainstream journalist is is to speak to a specific audience. It's no good thinking as you speak to the British audience and you're desperately trying to explain to them what caused this international crisis and you're standing in New York, it's no good trying to think what does the guy standing next to me, the taxi driver, listening to this British guy think. I, I, you cannot do that because your job is to communicate. So I would say, and of course the communist parties and the other left parties had this problem exactly as they went to the non-Western, non-Northern Hemisphere situation. Uh, you know, if you look at, um, if you go to China and look at the way that the Chinese tried to explain Marxism, Chinese communism in the 50s, there were some beautiful uh, posters, but the, the, what Marxism is, it, it's not just that uh, the politics was wrong. I mean, I don't agree with Chairman Mao, its version of Marxism, but, the logic system that certain languages produce is very different. Uh, so, I don't know. Um, but that's, that's, what, that's what I think, that this, that's the general principle, to try and adapt it to the logic system and the language that is out there. Even, to be honest, in English, alienation does not mean self-estrangement in English. It just doesn't mean it. And valorization of the word only ex exists in the English language because of Marx. It, it doesn't exist, it's not really there. So there's a huge challenge for us. Hallo? Yeah. Unsere Zeitung hat ja äh, eine Geschichte, äh, sowohl eine Vorgeschichte sowohl im Osten als auch im Westen, mit dem Sonntag eben im Osten und äh, der Deutschen Volkszeitung im Westen und dann hieß ja auch am Anfang sozusagen die Ost-West-Wochenzeitung und vielleicht ist es eine, 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 eine ähnliche Gemengelage, äh, wir haben da immer wieder sozusagen Diskussionen, sowohl was von den Lesenden herkommt, als auch von den Redakteurinnen und Redakteuren sozusagen. Nicht jetzt ganz speziell nur in Bezug auf Marx, äh, sondern ganz generell. Und was ich ja immer am produktivsten äh, finde, ist dann die sich gegenüberstehenden Pole 
gemeinsam ins Gespräch zu bringen. Also das, das Format des Streitgesprächs zum Beispiel ist äh, mit eines derer, die ich am liebsten sozusagen äh, lese. Wir hatten das jetzt äh, zu einer Jubiläumsausgabe vor einiger Zeit mit ähm, einer ostdeutschen und einer westdeutschen äh, Redakteurin bzw. ehemaligen Redakteurin moderiert von äh, einer aktuellen Redakteurin, die einfach in Bezug auf die, 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 die Widersprüche äh, zwischen den beiden, in Bezug auf, die, auf Emanzipation, auf die Frauenbewegung und so weiter, das war ein großartiges Gespräch und vielleicht ist ja das auch ein Format, das hier äh, auf dieser Ebene sozusagen produktiv wirken kann. Also ich kann es nur sehr empfehlen, ich finde das immer äh, ganz lehrreich und spannend. Hi, um, I'm Alex Gallas from the University of Kassel and um, I'm quite tempted to defend Louis Althusser, but I'm not going to go down that road now, who's, who's one of the most misunderstood thinkers in, in, in Marxism. Um, I want to put something different to you, uh, Paul. Um, I thought the strongest moment in your first film was when you Uh, took out your smartphone and said, you know, does the smartphone control us or do we control it? And obviously that raises a contradiction about this whole format in the sense that um, how do we deal with digital technology and how do we use it to, to propagate political ideas, intellectual ideas? and so forth, um, and from your writings and also from those, those films, I sense that you are fairly optimistic about the opportunities. I want to put to you as a provocation something different. Um, this semester I'm using the anniversary to teach capital to undergraduate students. And um, from what I can say, uh, uh, from what I can see, it's, it's, it's uh, um, a, a very successful attempt um, to get them fired up about Marx, to engage them with his thinking and so forth. But what I did was, when they entered class for the first time, I said to them, leave your smartphones and your computers at home. This room is just about one book. Take out your pencils, make notes on paper. I don't want to see any of your digital technology because this is sort of something that takes an intellectual effort and I see this digital technology, at least in that context, as an obstacle and as a distraction. I think that's a great way of, uh, of teaching. Uh, personally, when I teach as well, I wish I could say this with confidence about any subject, Get, take the stuff away. But there's an interesting, um, as pe people know, that I believe there is a technological route beyond capitalism. Well, let's not go into that debate now, but insofar as it relates to what you just said, <clears throat> what I would like to see done is the creation of a digital model of Das Kapital. And I, I'm sure that it can be done because uh, quite a number of, uh, of practicing Marxist economists effectively have this. And I don't know whether you know whether someone has tried it. But we now have the ability to create different kinds of digital models. Uh, so, so That Marx himself created a digital model of the exploitation process because all these S, V, C, you know, S, the, the, the equations in capital are a, the basis on which you could construct the model. But the really interesting thing about digital technology right now is, is that, so I did a speech about post-capitalism in Vienna three days ago, and at the end somebody come, came to me and said, I am using agent-based modeling, uh, what can we do? And I would love to see different kinds of, of, of modeling using the, 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 the computing power of, tech, of, of, of high technology used to try and bring something to our models as Marxists that from Capital, Volume 1, 2, and 3, uh, and beyond, because you can create models from Hilferding, you can create models from uh, Heinrich Grossman, if you want to, the, 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 the Marxist theorists of crisis. Old economic modeling was always effectively uh, abstract. So as few, like Einstein says, as few 
concepts as possible. The smallest number of words used to describe reality. That's a, a, a 20th century concept of how you model reality. 21st century digital technology allows us to have what they call realism. That is, to, to, to inject real data into your model. Climate models exist like this. They, they have a model of the climate, but they inject data into it from balloons and satellites above the Earth. I would like to try and create this model of the exploitation process from capital and actually use real data and see if we can make, although it is, of course, an abstract, uh, deep process that Marx is describing, I think it could be possible to... Because if you can't model an abstract process and then bring layers of reality into it, that I think it should be possible. And one final, one final point. If you speak to uh, scientists and technologists who are involved in the creation of artificial intelligence through what are called artificial neural networks, which is what created this Google DeepMind computer, the key concept for them, and it's so beautiful, the key concept in their minds is levels of abstraction. The exact concept which Marx introduces in the preface to Capital. They understand that, eat their, that their models cannot work without several layers of abstraction away from realism. And I think that's a great vindication of Marx in, a, in its own way, but maybe we should discuss this in greater detail after the meeting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mich würde ja noch interessieren, wie das, äh, wie das von den Studierenden äh, genau angenommen wurde. Gab es Widerstand? Waren alle total beglückt danach? Oder wie, 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 wie lief der Kurs ab? Wie läuft der Kurs ab? Also hat super funktioniert. <lacht> ich war ganz erstaunt. Normalerweise ähm, ist das ja in Universitäten heute sehr ungewöhnlich, dass man sagt, man liest in einem Semester ein Buch, das 800 Seiten lang ist. Also erste Band des Kapitals, zumindest in großen Ausschnitten. Und äh, mein Eindruck ist, ähm, dass es ja sogar fast, wenn ich das jetzt sehr optimistisch deute, vielleicht als befreiend gesehen wird, dass man mal in so einem ganz anderen Setting zusammenarbeitet und ähm, sich ja dieser intellektuellen Aufgabe auch versucht zu stellen. Also mein Eindruck ist, die Leute haben Lust, die Leute stellen viele Fragen, diskutieren sehr viel und ähm, das funktioniert auch noch äh, im Jahr 2018. Ja, der Herr dahinter. Um, good morning. Uh, this is a question for Paul, um, but everyone, of course, is welcome to answer it. Uh, this is, I, I guess, specifically because um, I'm from the United States. I study here in the North American program at the Free, uh, at the Free University. And um, uh, I really enjoy, I've, I've, I've seen part one already before this, and it's, it's, it's refreshing seeing a presentation of Marxism in an easy to understand methodology, especially for people who may not be so interested in this. Um, and kind of tying into that, um, in the United States right now, um, there is, you know, um, I don't know if uh, uh, you or everyone here is aware of it, but the teacher strikes going on particularly in traditionally reactionary um, areas like West Virginia, Oklahoma, and my home state of Arizona. Um, how would you see a format um, such as what you're presenting with momentum and, and, and that of the left um, permeating potentially with these groups who do have this general sense of class consciousness, who do have this general sense of, of alienation, but also then through this, you know, you know, idea then of, of false consciousnesses of, you know, reactionary tendencies, like these people did vote for Trump and such like that. So um, I guess just your opinion on that with, with the context, I guess, in, in, in an American sense of, of these relations. So, yeah, these teacher strikes should be having far more attention because they are, in the fifth uh, film, which has just been finished, which you won't see today, um, I, do, I am filming myself giving a lecture on the picket line of a university teacher's strike, and I'm making the point about knowledge, the knowledge economy. These are, the, in a way, the proletariat of the knowledge economy. Okay. How, I think with this thing that we have, the world transformed, we've only had three big events, but it's an amazingly good formula. But as long as you work 
it in a different way to this. What, what we realized is that, look, it's, it's very strange to be saying this, that we have a movement of half a million people that has no political philosophy. It has a program which is agreed by, by the majority and a leader who is idolized. And here's the reason, and, and there's a minority of neoliberals, Blairite, centrist people who hate it. The reason why we don't have a political philosophy is it's too dangerous to have one up to now. Because what you would have to do, if you were really honest, would say, what do we think about the Russian Revolution? Okay, that's number one question, right? Why, how do I know this? Because on the anniversary of the Russian Revolution, um, I wrote my article for you. Um, I got rung up by um, lots and lots of TV programs. Come on and talk about it. Radio. And I did. Do you know who didn't? Who didn't want to talk about it? Were the people I would call orthodox communists from the communist tradition, like the one that built this building. They didn't want to be on at all. Um, and so it was left to a Gramscian, Negrian, Trotskyist, or anarcho-syndicalist, whatever you want to call me, to defend 1917, and I did. But the problem is, what do we think about 1917? And this is why Labour can't have, Corbyn's Labour can't really have a political philosophy. So what we've really come up with is a kind of from practice, new political philosophy that I describe as a kind of cut price Gramscianism. It's really what it is. All the academics who teach at The World Transformed are really Gramscian, like you know Stuart Hall, the, um, the, the English sociologist. His, the people he taught are the core cadre of who teaches at The World Transformed. But I think if you do it that way, because the danger would be for, in America is that you, you say we're going to do a, a, a political consciousness thing. Wow, everybody turns up. Who's going to turn up? You know who's going to turn up. Bob Avakian and the, you know, the, the Maoist Communist Party or all the Trotskyists. And then before you know it, there's a battle. So we avoided this battle by actually just saying, well, what, are, what emerges from our practice? What is neoliberalism? Then you can have Saint the Saint, the Saint of our movement, David Harvey. Then you can have Harvey. Then you can have the other Saint, David Graeber. And then you can have, you can have uh, key feminist thinkers if you can get them to come. That's, what we, that's where we're at. And do you know what I think is interesting? I've studied the Paris Commune and the, the, the workers' movement in the lead-up to the Paris Commune from 1860s to 18, in the 1870s. The, as you may know, it was a, a, a battle between Marxism, Proudhonist anarchism, and Blanquist left socialism. Um, the workers kind of created their own mixture of it. If you read Louise Michel's writings, she's creating a mixture in her head of Marxism, feminism, Blanquism. That's what we're doing. Um, and I think, I, I find that exciting, but of course it's theoretically non-rigorous. Do you want to add something? Mehr, gibt es mehr Fragen? Nein, gerade nicht. Gut, dann stelle ich noch mal eine. Wir in der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung, wir müssen uns ja, beschäftigen uns ja auch mit unserer eigenen Namensgeberin und hat das mit Marx sehr gut funktioniert, ne? zu sagen 200 Jahre Marx und es gibt in komischer Weise in dem Moment entsteht eine Diskussion über eine neue Klassenpolitik und alle springen auf und der Bundespräsident gibt ein Dinner und wir werden eingeladen, also die Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung und so weiter. Ähm, jetzt fragen wir uns, äh, ist, das, äh, ist das mit äh, vielen Denkerinnen und Denkern machbar, Sebastian? Denkst du, wenn jetzt im Januar der 100. Todestag von Rosa Luxemburg ist, dass was Ähnliches entsteht, weil die Leute sich eigentlich danach sehen, nach so einer Art von Identifikationsfiguren? Und dann müssen wir uns aber gleichzeitig fragen, ja, müssen die immer schon mindestens 100 oder 200 Jahre tot sein, damit das überhaupt funktioniert? Ich glaube, das kann sehr gut funktionieren. Äh, endlich mal eine Frau sozusagen. Also ich meine, das ist ja sozusagen wie, wie, wie heute äh, in Bezug auf die Protagonisten heute ne? in den USA, Bernie Sanders in Großbritannien, äh, Jeremy Corbyn und wir überlegen auch, ich habe vorhin über diese Titelgebungsschwierigkeiten immer gesprochen, da war schon wieder einen alten Mann jetzt irgendwie sozusagen da auf den Titel drauf. Also wir, wir, wir bereiten dann schon mal den Luxemburg-Titel vor. Ähm, Finde ich super. Aber... Ähm, 
es kommt eben ganz auf die Formate an und wenn ihr sozusagen wieder solche Formate wie diese Filme zu Marx beispielsweise schafft, äh, dann bin ich da total optimistisch, dass auch äh, es großen, großen Aufschlag geben wird nächstes Jahr dann äh, mit Rosa Luxemburg. Ich hoffe es doch mal. Oder was denkst du denn selbst? Ähm, ja, also ähm, wir haben in Vorbereitung jetzt die Übersetzung der äh, Graphic Novel von Kate Evans. Sie bringt der Dietz Verlag jetzt im Oktober raus. Das haben wir pünktlich also gemacht. Wir machen dazu auch nochmal einen Film und versuchen natürlich auch immer äh, mit anderen Formaten zu arbeiten. Noch schöner wäre es jetzt ge gewesen, wenn Rosa Luxemburg eine beinharte Feministin gewesen wäre. Ne? Dann hätte es uns das einfacher gemacht. Ich sage dann immer, wenn ich gefragt werde, naja, die hat zwar gesagt, sie ist keine Feministin, aber sie ist dann immer auf dem Frauenticket zum Parteikongress gefahren. Damit versuche ich sie jetzt so im Nachhinein so ein bisschen äh, vorzuführen, dass sie ja doch eine gewesen ist. Ähm, wichtig finde ich aber dabei, äh, du hast das auch nochmal gesagt, Paul, äh, zur, ähm, äh, zu der ganzen Frage jetzt von Mobilisierung, ne? das steht ja auch im Raum, Momentum hat das geschafft, äh, in Labour, in Großbritannien Labour sozusagen so zu mobilisieren, dass, äh, dass es überhaupt möglich war, dass Corbyn Vorsitzender geworden ist und sich der linke Flügel innerhalb der Labour-Partei durchgesetzt habt. Wir sehen das jetzt, in, wir haben das gesehen in Polen unter sehr schwierigen politischen Bedingungen, dass es gerade, als es um Abtreibungs, als um die Abtreibungsdebatten ging, eine Mobilisierung möglich war. Wir haben in Spanien jetzt einen äh, feministischen Streik gesehen, an dem sich sechs Millionen Leute beteiligt haben. Ich glaube, das ist sozusagen einer der größten äh, Streiks überhaupt gewesen ähm, äh, in Europa in den letzten Jahren. Wie können wir denn jetzt auch das, was sozusagen was wir aus, jetzt den, aus der neuen Klassenpolitik oder vielleicht auch dem Wiederfinden von Marx äh, finden, verbinden mit diesen Bewegungen, mit der feministischen Bewegung, um das in Gang zu setzen. Yes. Um, so, my, my politics, my theory um, is saying that the, the things that actually Rosa Luxemburg understood about capitalism was that it had limits, and one of those limits was set by its, its desire and its need to find a non-capitalist world. This is what she writes in The, the Accumulation of Capital. Now, it, it, I have uh, criticized Luxemburg by saying that in the time, what she thought she meant was the colonial markets of the imperialist countries. As soon as they were exhausted, there were no more, she said, then the, the, there will be a crisis. In the time it took her to write the book, the number of movie theaters in this city grew from one to 163. So in other words, it wasn't about Southwest Africa and finding the limits of the colonial world. The, Capitalism found a world outside itself in the brains of Berlin workers and drew them in large numbers into, into the movies. So, so but the, the thought was right that capitalism must colonize the non-market, the anti-market, no, its personal life. One of the huge sources of optimism I have is that I, I see capitalism like this. It has two sources of dynamism. And one source is the outside world. In this sense, in systems theory, it is a, an open system. It's a, it interacts with other systems and gains dynamism from it. The other thing is, it has dynamism internally through technological innovation. But if you've read my book, you will know that I believe that the technological innovation side of it is no longer producing... Uh, adaptability and dynamism for the value system. Therefore, it is more and more reliant on the other part, which is colonization. Let's use you know, the, the old word, colonization of the non-market. Now, look outside, look at, look at all these people sitting on the coffee bars, people uh, going to work in a coffee bar, people um, living their everyday lives. What I think is obvious to everybody is capitalism is coming for your leisure time. Capitalism is coming for your personality, for your relationship, for your friendship, for your sex life. It needs to commercialize everything. This is what André Gortz said in, uh, in the 1980s. Gortz, in uh, the Critique of Economic Reason, says, capitalism will invade the personality so badly that people will revolt. And um, 
Pret-a-Manger, I don't know if you've been, to, I don't think Pret-a-Manger exists here, but it's a, it's a coffee bar type system. On record, they, they, a journalist did an investigation into them. They have, you have to smile. You have to be happy. The rules are, you cannot pretend to be happy. And if you pretend, if you're just there to work for the money, your fellow workers have the right to vote you to be sacked. So it's no longer, it's, uh, you know, a sex worker, an actor, has the right to look happy, but to not be happy. A pret-a-manger worker has no right to not be happy. Do you think they're happy? No, they hate it. And if we can say to them, Luke, there is an explanation for this, and it can't go on. And you have the right to have what my father had, the right to be unhappy at work and to express yourself. You have the right to do that. Um, I think we can connect with everybody. How's, how's, the, how's the mood? How's the, how, what, how do the workers there at that cafe uh, interact? Are they on strike? Are they organized? Are they, are they, is there any resistance? There was. Uh, the anarchists tried to organize a union there, but they were sacked. That's what happened. That's why the article was written. It was in the London Review of Books by a, a, an author called Paul Myersko. And I interviewed the anarchist or, uh, organizer on camera for an hour. And then he rang me up and said, take it away because I, I will be victimized in my next job. So it's never been uh, filmed. The, the film was never shown. But we have McDonald's strikes. And uh, now, Pret-a-Manger Pret is... It's like a cult. In the morning, the manager kind of does the cult activity and everybody has to get happy. In McDonald's, it's not so, it, you can't do this because McDonald's is far more brutal industrial capitalism. So I'll tell you a story about what we did. There's a small left wing union in Britain called the Baker's Union, uh, led by the left, and it decided to unionize McDonald's. And it started with five people going on symbolic strike. And because they did this up front and pr pr promoted it as a human right, they weren't sacked. Momentum did what a union can't do and what a party can't do. We made a video uh, with the real workers, McDonald workers, showing us all their um, injuries, the burns that they had on their arms and the problems that they had, and telling the story. But we used actors to tell the story, so the real workers were never seen, only their arms. Momentum has this amazing social network. We have 40,000 members nearly. We have at least 100,000 email address. And we have millions of followers on Twitter and Facebook. And we, we're able to use micro-targeting and the Facebook, same tools that Cambridge Analytica used. It's not illegal to use them. You basically know who's seen it. And we made this video. Not only was it widely seen, we know that three out of every four people who works for McDonald's saw the video. So this is an amazing thing to be able to do. And on May Day, 1st of May, there was a much bigger McDonald's strike as a result of this. The McDonald's strikes took place in six or seven cities with real participation, not symbolic participation. So I, I, I think this is on, for me only part of things because I'm, that was one thing. Look at the Me Too movement. Look at the Me Too movement. It's a, it's a movement against the colonization of my personal space by male power in the workplace. And it's spread not only to America and Britain, China. The Chinese women are now organizing a Me Too movement and immediately they have to defy the state censorship, go underground using WeChat and uh, Telegram and everything else. And it's the ability to link these wider social issues to exploitation for which I think, coming back to Das Kapital and our friends who understand modern Das Kapital, is we, we have to explain how exploitation works, how rent works, how, how, how coercion in the workplace is utterly central to the way modern exploitation has to work. And I think that that's the, work, the kind of movement that we will build. Um, yeah, I see it. I ask a question, then they are there. 
Ich, äh, um nochmal bei dem Bild äh, mit den Coffeeshops zu bleiben, als ähm, Euro, unser Europareferat hier in der äh, Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung hat äh, acht Standorte, arbeitet in 28 Ländern, da fahren wir dann eben auch eine ganze Menge rum und ich habe immer das Gefühl, ja, wenn ich in Kiew dann in einen Coffeeshop gehe, was dann vorkommt, ja, da sind die ganzen Ketten, Pret à Manger und so weiter, auch in der ähm, Innenstadt von Kiew, die jetzt so aussieht wie jede andere kapitalistische Großstadt und da arbeiten dann die für einen sehr schlechten Lohn die Flüchtlinge aus der Ostukraine. Wenn ich dann in Warschau in die gleiche Kette gehe, sind da die, die Migranten aus der Westukraine, die in Polen arbeiten, weil da der Lohn um ganz bisschen höher ist. Und wenn ich in London in einen Coffeeshop gehe, dann sind da die Polen, die da arbeiten. Das heißt, es reicht nicht, wenn wir sagen, die, wir organisieren sozusagen in den Ländern oder wir haben Momentum, sondern wie machen wir das, wie kommen wir dahin zu sagen, sagen, okay, ihr sitzt zwar in unterschiedlichen Ländern, in sehr unterschiedlichen Bedingungen, aber wie organisieren wir das auch nochmal überregional, transnational? Um, I think we live in a time when, when When, we, when people spontaneously use network technology in a way that allows them to, 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 to do what the sociologists in the 1990s noticed about young workers. They have weak ties with organizations. If you're a trade union activist, you'll know how difficult it is to get young workers into any permanent organization. And it's true also in labor. They will join, they will put the badge, the meme, but they won't do anything. Okay? They don't want to be under discipline or hierarchy. Now, in this sense, I think that we should not expect the re-emergence of either the, something like the first international or um, the Comintern, but we should, what we should expect rather is the viral emergence of forms of behavior and ideas that will definitely cross borders. Me Too has definitely crossed borders. Black Lives Matter crossed borders. Um, and the Occupy movement, you know, the, the, the The, the taking the creation of, an, of a mental image of what you want and then you move it into real space and occupy a, a city square was a viral uh, event. And I think we will, th this is the world we live in. And of course, the problem is getting trade unions to understand what this means is quite difficult. This viral event came and it screwed up my, my, my careful plan for the next five years. Um, and parties as well. Uh, but... Right now, I would say also the other thing I observed during the, especially the Occupy movement, was the importance of physical movement of people. So exactly, these people who are moving from one city to another, one country to another, in, it, you know, I literally went to a occupation in London and met these people and I started to follow them on Twitter, young students, and then... I saw in the audience people who'd lived in ZAD, you know, the, in the part of the Invisible Committee, and then they, next time I saw them, they were in Spain on the Puerto del Sol in Madrid, occupying that. And then, then on the Day of the Camels in, in, in uh, Cairo, these two students who I'd met in London, they, I just followed their Twitter feed, and it just said, we are throwing stones and camels are attacking us. <laughs> and I just said, shit, they've gone to Cairo. Uh, uh, and this is actually what happened. So, you, if you read the account of the early Comintern, you know, uh, guys hanging from underneath a train to get from Austria to Moscow, um, you know, in the snow. This generation is spontaneously doing the equivalent of that. It's about here. There was a question here. Um, just, just, eine, eine Sekunde bitte, das Mikrofon, damit es übersetzt werden kann. Thanks. Uh, Nick Dyer with the Fort University of Western Ontario. Uh, Paul, <laughs> your story about Prea Monger is so brilliant. Um, it really makes me ask uh, um, why you actually don't expound Marx starting from that point yeah. rather than starting with Marx and working up to Prea Monger. I know because you're an expert communicator, you must have thought about this, choi this, this choice. And I have to think about it too, uh, as a teacher, teaching large university classes. Um, if I had a critique of your generally excellent films, I would say that they're a little too archaeological. 
Um, of course, an anniversary invites that sort of treatment. But I wonder really if for those people who we hope to draw into the struggle for a communist society, the best thing to do is not to start with the issues of precarity, the issues of uh, the invasion of personality via, uh, via social media, which you so vividly described, the uh, concerns about ecological uh, catastrophe, to start from those points and then to work back to the relevance of Marxism, to the search for a solution to this. Because to be ultimately honest with you, I mean, I care really only about Marx and Rosa Luxemburg really only because they are theorists of the struggle for, uh, for communism. Um, uh, you know, uh, there are many other intrinsically fascinating uh, uh, his, uh, historical figures. So clearly, you made what I'm sure is a considered choice to start from the past and work, uh, and, and work uh, forward. I'm just interested as to why you didn't take the other route and go from the past back. So, Luke, I think your idea there is a whole other series. And, and I'll explain why I didn't do it in a minute. But I would say, look, we're in a room with people who have resources. We have filmmakers in the room. Let them, you know, go and make, let's, you know, we, we could put a team together really easily. I mean, I, I won't embarrass myself or you by saying how much those movies cost, but it is not much. Yeah? Um, we could really easily put a team together that would make five films exactly like that. And I think we should. Okay, we, we, maybe maybe the Denkmaler to Rosa Luxemburg should be that some of you know some of that as well. Um, I also I also would say I would like to see those films made by younger Marxists, female Marxists, other people with better voices. Because what I know about myself is that it's very frustrating. Um, Okay, as a journalist, I've done some things that I think, you know, my journal, the best journalism I've ever done was was what we call in Britain a sc scoops when you ha expose somebody. So chasing down a corridor, a guy who's sold an African country a fake cure to, for AIDS, staking him out, filming him secretly, selling this bullshit to 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 the, the Swaziland government, or going to Gaza to co cover the conflict in Gaza. Um, but when people come up to me on the street, they go, thank you. Who doesn't want to be liked? Thank you. What for? Explaining things. That's what they always say. I don't care, give a shit about your journalism, you know, the things that you care about. It's the fact that you can explain it clearly. And I thought, well, I'm a 50-something-year-old white man who has studied Marx, and therefore the thing I want to do... And it took me a long time, actually, to write the alienation um, uh, script. I, I, I had to think, you know, what reread Bertel Ullmann, reread uh, Istvan Metzaros. Uh, what do they? What do they really say? Um, and come up with some a simplified, clear version of what it says. You see the one on revolutions. It was really difficult in a minute to 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 get it down to two points. What does Marx say about revolution? Uh, I think that's. To be able to do that with confidence as a journalist, you know, uh, without getting into, to be honest, I try to keep away from all the Althusser and, you know, determination without getting away from that. Because actually, if somebody watches Alienation and thinks, okay, I want to read more about it, and then the first thing they read is Louis Althusser saying, these texts should be thrown back into the darkness, they might be even more interested in, in well, what does he say? Why is he more, uh, more interesting? Um, so I thought, to do that with some confidence and clarity would be a good thing. And, um, you know, I'd love to see... You could make a feature film about Das Kapital. You really could make a feature film about Capital. But the, the, when we see the, the, the revolution one, which is the one that I like the best, and it's the city I like the best in Paris, what I think, what I think you'll see is the other marks I want people to know is the human being, the activist, you know, there was a play in London, The Young Marx. It was really good, actually. It was a bourgeois play about Marx, you know, sleeping with Helena Damut and all this. It was a fine, fine, fine. But when I went to do the 
so Marx, you'll see in a minute, Marx did a speech on the first night he got to Paris in 1848. Didn't do it on the 12th night, on the first night. So he's deported, he gets off the train. I, I decided to walk from the train station to the place he did the speech. It's about a kilometer. So it's like he lived, he did things, he intervened, he was fallible. I really want us to take that Marx away. Um, and I think that if those people, those young pret manger workers, understand that this was only actually a guy like them, he'd been to university, he'd done things like, unfortunately, sleeping with his maid, and all these things, they can actually understand better that this wasn't some white god, you know, god, god, god made of brass, like we see in Karl Marx Forum here in Berlin. He was far more like, you know, a person made out of papier-mâché that we see outside. There was one question there in the back, yeah. Um. Hello, uh, I'm Sudha. I teach in a university in Delhi. Uh, and um, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you said, and that's also what we do in the sense we are involved in sort of in a group trying to make things simple and easy. And, and um, but one of the questions, uh, Madhav, I have for myself that I also want to pose to you. If this in some sense is also a matter of the times we live in and therefore self-fulfilling. I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, in response to your last question, uh, last, uh, your, in your last response, you were talking about how, uh, I mean, young people are very, very attracted to these kinds of events, these kinds of media, and they would, you know, uh, put out messages on Twitter or put their badges on, but they would also not join an organization. Right? I think it's also a character of the times where a precariat worker then really doesn't have time to go to weekly meetings, to do the readings, to kind of do the discipline thing that an earlier generation thought was the center of organization. What I worry about in what we do is that this kind of, we do get, again, it's very popular, there's lots of young people who come to these meetings who watch these things. It does, it, it brings us a, self of, a sense of exhilaration that yes, they're with us, but uh, the the problem with virals that I see over time is that they have a peak and they go down. So that sense of continuity, that what happens over a period of 20 years of this kind of, kind of popularization have we created, because the final goal is in fact moving towards something like communism, whether this is counterproductive. It's a question I ask myself and it's something that I want to pose to you. I would be interested in, in how that plays it out in, the, in your audience though. Uh, However, okay, I think we're seeing the emergence of a new kind of struggle. And what I've already explained where I think it comes from, from the networked individuality of people and the fact that they live atomized lives and that they're exploited through several channels, through work, through leisure, through uh, communication, through finance. And so... What needs to happen with them is that they need to go through the same process that Marx describes, um, I think it's in The Poverty of Philosophy, where he talks about the working class going from uh, a class in itself to a class for itself. Now, of course, he never uses the words in itself. He says the working class has defined itself as a class vis-a-vis -vis capital. It's, a, it's written in French. Class vis-a-vis -vis capital, a class against capital, and now it must define itself as a class for itself. I have written, I've written a, just written an essay for Open Democracy in Britain where I say the point has to be that's like a, that's a practical problem. How do this young generation go from seeing them, what is common between, say, me, so, you know, so a 20-year-old uh, student, 20-year-old Pret-a-Manger worker, you know, what is common between us? They can see what is common, actually. They all live these precarious lives. They're all confronted by issues around sexuality and identity. That's a big front of mind for them. Uh, the forms of oppression are coercion at work, uh, male dominance, we now find out from Me Too, uh, racial, racism and racial oppression, severe insecurity about their ability to, to act, often, no. From 2011, we of course have seen these peaks and troughs, the wave, cre the Iranian revolutionaries called it wave creation. 
So you do one thing, you see how far you can get with it, and then you drop it. I mean, you know, the, my grandfather's generation would go, this is crazy. You build an organization, and then you destroy it, and then you start again. Why? Well, that's, in the, that's how it feels, that's how, what works in modern society. So we have to find more innovative ways of leaving behind a trail of, not so much organizations, but patterns that you can pick up. Almost like, if you get some hackers into a, a room, they call them camps, bar camps, and they all bring their sleeping bag, after about the fifth one, even though they're doing a completely different thing, they operate more or less in the same way. They know what one of these things is. And it's the same with the student occupation, and it's the same with setting up a, an alternative radio station. You kind of understand what needs to be done. And I think that's where we are. Actually, the most depressing thing for me, I say this in Britain, is to see all these people who were occupying universities in 2011 now sitting in Momentum's office with a spreadsheet obsessing about the electoral process. What's the law? What, where's the spreadsheet? Where You go here. You, you should be moving from city A to city B by 5 o'clock tomorrow. That's really depressing. I want them to rediscover their spontaneity in a bit more. Um, but, of course, between horizontality and verticality, there is, let's call it diagonalness, diagonality. That's what we need to achieve. And that is, in fact, what I think, say, the, my idealistic generation, the, the, the generation I idealise, as well as the workers from Rosa Luxemburg's era, were the workers from the, the commune. And if you read the real story... Um, is it called in German, uh, Unser Fahn bleibt rot, by Oscar Hipper? Oscar Hipper. Uh, Oscar Hipper, our flag stays red. Hipper was from social democracy. He became a left communist, but he also describes in the Saxony area the emergence of an anarcho-syndicalist German working class that took control of the factories, that had militias and marched around... Um, Chemnitz and these other cities um, shooting at people. This is, this is the story you don't hear, you know, from, from the official history of German communism. They were quite, li they were quite, quite disorganized as well. Good. Ich hätte noch eine Frage an dich, Sebastian, bevor wir gleich noch mal die letzten, die anderen beiden Filme ansehen. Ähm, Paul hat das eben äh, irgendwie so nett genannt, wir müssen eine Form des Verhaltens, ne? eine ne? Form of Behavior, das ist das, was wir transportieren müssen, weil es zu gefährlich ist, eine Ideologie auszurufen und so weiter. Wie ist das überhaupt möglich jetzt für eine Zeitung wie eure in, in diesem hart umkämpften Markt, in der schwierigen Situation, in der ihr ja auch seid, äh, diese, vielleicht diesen Duktus umzusetzen? Wie macht ihr das? Geht das? Und wenn ja, wie macht ihr das? Also ich bin ein großer Freund von so innerredaktioneller Pluralität auch. Also ich habe das ja vorhin schon in Bezug auf dieses Gespräch äh, über Emanzipation und Frauenbewegung beschrieben. Wir versuchen das auch in allen möglichen Auseinandersetzungen, die es gerade innerhalb der Linken gibt, so in der Zeitung wiederzuspiegeln, damit nur die eine Seite sozusagen die eine Woche äh, sich an den Kopf fasst und dann in der nächsten Woche vielleicht die andere Woche und darüber dann vielleicht auch ein produktiver Dialog äh, hinauskommt. Aber was ich auch im Anschluss an Paul sagen kann, ich, ich stelle ja in meinem wenig Du hast ja die Leserschaft und so bei uns angesprochen, kann ich jetzt nicht so viel dazu sagen, aber in meinem eigenen Umfeld, so ne, Leute um die 30, irgendwie so, auch eine, erstaunlicherweise nicht nur einen großen Zuspruch auf der einen Seite fest, so zu ja, Arbeitskämpfen, wie sie jetzt gerade auch ausgetragen werden von den Fahrerinnen und Fahrern dieser, dieser äh, Online-Plattform für Essensbestellungen und so, so ähm, die, die, die jetzt ja auch medial immer wieder so hochpoppen oder so, wo man sagt so, ja gut, dass die jetzt so, sondern auf der anderen Seite auch so eine großen, so ein großes, schon durchaus noch ein Widerstand, weil ich habe das vorhin beschrieben mit diesen überhaupt keine Idee davon haben, warum man in eine Gewerkschaft gehen sollte und so und das ist, also das, das finde ich dann immer wieder sozusagen, also mich richtig gehend depressiv machen, so dieses, naja, aber eigentlich ist doch alles irgendwie schon so, hm, ja, ich habe einen Job und das ist so, also die, die Masse an Menschen, die trotz aller irgendwie um uns rum feststellbaren Aufbrüche, so Monumentum oder so, äh, äh, da ist, die, die, die immer noch sozusagen glaubt, dass irgendwie das alles so, die ist doch erstaunlich hoch und da wiederum ist dann 
sind dann gerade solche Arbeitsthemen, die ganz konkret sich auf eine Situation in einer Branche, in einem Betrieb oder so weiter, äh, Prêt manger zum Beispiel war dieses Beispiel, was wir jetzt heute hatten oder so, die, äh, die bekommen immer wahnsinnig viel Zuspruch und, und Rückmeldung. Also wenn man ganz konkret die, die Ausbeutungssituation einer Arbeitnehmerin, eines Arbeitnehmers äh, gegenüber sozusagen ihrem, 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 ihrem Arbeitgeber, ihrer Arbeitgeberin äh, feststellt und das dann sozusagen in Form von einer, einer Reportage bringt, das sind immer Geschichten, über, zu denen bekommt man am intensivsten wirklich Rückmeldungen. Das berührt die Menschen am meisten und das lässt dann immer wieder auch am meisten Leute erkennen, so, oh nee, ist doch ja nicht alles so hier ganz behaglich und klar, da gibt es einen Widersatz und äh, der empört mich, der, der, der bringt mich auf und so. Und ich glaube, über genau solche Formate, die sich jetzt nicht äh, aufhalten mit großen äh, intellektuellen äh, Streitereien so darüber, was jetzt der richtige Weg ist, sondern ganz konkret am lebenden Objekt so zu, sozusagen zu, zu, zu berichten, zu recherchieren, das ist etwas, was ich bei uns auch sehr viel gern noch viel mehr machen und etablieren würde, was aber natürlich dann wiederum äh, auch ressourcenbedingt, die äh, so klein nicht sind und die man dann erstmal sozusagen sich zusammensammeln muss, um auch da Arbeitskraft reinzustecken, reinstecken zu können. Gut, ähm, herzlichen Dank äh, äh, an euch beide. Ich finde, schöner hätten wir hier den Marx Geburtstag morgen fast gar nicht verbringen können, ne, weil wir ihn gleichermaßen geehrt haben, als auch äh, als ganz normalen äh, Menschen äh, wieder äh, in die Ecke zurückgestellt äh, haben. Und ähm, wir bereiten uns jetzt alle vor. Also ihr beide sucht euch noch ein paar junge Feministinnen neben mir, mit denen ihr dann die Rosa-Luxemburg-Filme macht. Wir, äh, wir beide bereiten die Ausgabe vor. Wir als Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung machen so, sowieso sehr viel. Der 100. Todestag von Rosa Luxemburg soll nämlich kein trauriges Event werden, sondern ähnlich wie der Geburtstag von Marx in Verbindung mit dem 150. Geburtstag, der dann ein bisschen folgt, auch eine positive Ehrung. Ich wünsche mir, dass ich euch beide zu, äh, zu diesem Anlass am 12. Januar ist äh, der große Auftakt äh, dann auch wieder sehe. Wir schauen jetzt die, Letzt, äh, die, die Folge 3 und 4 von k for karl den fünften äh, veröffentlichen wir auf unserer Seite marx200.org, die ihr jetzt wahrscheinlich alle auch schon kennt, die das große Online-Projekt unserer Stiftung ähm, ähm, zum 200. Geburtstag von Marx ist. Da empfehle ich auch noch einen anderen neuen Beitrag, ähm, der heißt Marx als Migrant. Da zeigen wir auch noch mal, dass Marx zwar ein weißer, äh, bärtiger Mann war, aber eben auch ein Verfolgter, ein Migrant und wo er ähm, überall gewesen ist. Das Projekt wollen wir auch in der Zukunft noch äh, übersetzen. Herzlichen Dank an euch beide und euch allen noch einen äh, guten weiteren Geburtstag. At this university in London, students have joined their professors on strike. They're holding alternative lectures and I've been invited to talk about who else but Karl Marx. What could possibly be relevant about the ideas of Karl Marx for the 21st century? In an age of machines, Karl Marx was obsessed with them. Marx saw the replacement of labor by machinery as the route to human liberation from hunger, poverty and ignorance. Today, we are going through a third industrial revolution, the age of information, robotics and artificial intelligence. And in one remarkable document, Marx actually predicts the impact of rapid automation in a notebook called The Grundrisser, Marx asks what's the end point going to be of this whole process of automation. For the capitalists, he says, the ideal machine is going to be one that either lasts forever or costs zero to produce. To achieve that, you're going to need huge advances, not just in machinery, but also in organisation and knowledge. And Marx says you're going to end up with knowledge being socialised into what he calls a general intellect. Marx's theory of history goes like this. At each stage, the economic structure of society has to match the technology and the work routines needed to operate the technology. This combination of technology plus economic structure form a foundation 
on which ideas, religions, laws and cultures are built, a legal and political superstructure. At some point, the technology outgrows the economic structure and then begins an era of social revolution. In the past 20 years, information technology has changed almost everything about the world we live in and it leaves the question hanging just as Marx posed it. If information is everywhere and shared and abundant, why should a few people own it? Why do we have information monopolies at all? That's the question posed by Facebook's current crisis after the data of millions of people was misused to try and rig elections. Marx couldn't predict the rise of the internet, but he did predict what would happen if information became socialised and generally shared. It would blow the foundations of capitalism sky high. So you could say Facebook's crisis is a nice 200th birthday present for Karl Marx. I'm Paul Mason and I'm here in Manchester, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, to explore an idea Karl Marx was obsessed with. How do rich people get rich? Two hundred years ago, Manchester was the centre of the industrial world. What they'd invented here was not just a set of new technologies, but a whole new way of organising work. The factory system. The factory, in a way, is one of the most important pieces of technology ever invented. But once you're in there, there's only one deal on offer. Work, for wages, under somebody else's orders, or you starve. The factory system allowed productivity to take off like never before in human history. But it also produced misery, stunted children, falling life expectancy, bleak lives. The workers fought back. They went on strike for better pay. They asked for democracy. They rioted. When the workers in the early factories went on strike, they said, all we want is a fair day's pay. Marx told them that's impossible because the whole system is set up so that your work always produces more than what you are paid for. If you add up what it costs to produce a worker at the factory gate, that's on average what a worker is paid. The secret of the factory system is it always extracts more. Every society in history was based on a small elite grabbing the surplus food or the surplus land or the surplus gold. Capitalism, said Marx in a famous phrase, is based on the theft of alien labour time. When we go to work, says Marx, we're not just selling our labour, but our labour power, our ability to work. But work is not just an economic relationship, it is a power relationship, and that's what produces all the wealth in the world, the extra work we do for free. We work, the rich get the profits. That's exploitation. Marx wrote, No sooner does the worker receive his wages in cash than he is set upon by the other portions of the bourgeoisie, the landlord, the shopkeeper, the pawnbroker, etc. What he meant was, it's not just at work that we are exploited, but by rip-off landlords, by overcharging banks, and the pawnbroker hasn't disappeared from working-class life even now. Marx said, we'll only be free when we stop handing all the surplus wealth we produce to a small elite so it can live in luxury. For that, you have to destroy capitalism. <laughs>